In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verse 5. Matthew chapter 16, verse 5. Here it says, when the disciples went to the other side. Now they went to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and they forgot to take bread. They forgot about the bread. And how can you forget about the bread? Well, the same way we can forget about doctrine. And oftentimes we forget about doctrine ourselves, and we forget about what doctrine can do in terms of stabilizing our life and getting us on track, and using the promises of God, and believing them, etc. Then in 16.6, Jesus says, Watch out. Jesus said to them, Beware of the yeast, that's the false doctrine, of the Pharisees and Sadducees. We took down six points on the leaven. We won't go over that again. Then in 16.7, So they pondered among themselves, saying, Because we brought no bread. In other words, Is he rebuking us because we brought no bread? He's talking about the bread of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they're they're taking it literally. And they're thinking, we must not eat of the bread that the the Pharisees and Sadducees give to us. or, Or we must never eat of the bread of the... They take it literally. It's really stupid. It's figurative. And uh, it deals with a doctrinal principle. And he's not rebuking them because they brought no bread, but that's the first thing that pops into their mind. And that's because at this point they don't have an ability to really understand these spiritual matters. Their memories are terrible with regard to the Word of God. This shows they've had no concentration. They've not developed any norms or standards. They've never really developed a way to establish a firm system of doctrine because their mind wanders instead of listening to the Word. And then when they get out away from the Lord, then they fall all apart because they just perseverate on the things of the world. And they're really failures. And Peter is among them. But Peter becomes one of the greatest believers ever. And that should be an encouragement to us. It's better to start off a little shaky and to make it than to start off great guns and to fail. That's definitely a principle. And so it, it, uh, Peter actually turns out very well. <clears throat> so in 1617, uh, they were uh, talking about how they brought no bread. And then in 1618, Jesus perceiving this, Jesus said, People of a little faith, why are you reasoning among yourselves about having no bread? Now remember, this is in contrast to the Phoenician woman, the Gentile woman, a woman who had been looked down upon by the disciples. And our Lord looked at her and said, Woman, you of great faith. And now once again, He's looking at the disciples and He's saying, O people, uh, you of a little faith. They've got some. They have uh, just about enough that got them saved. They had faith alone in Christ alone, so they're saved. That's about all they've that's about as far as they've gone. And they've been listening to the Lord for approximately two years now. They've been under his ministry. And remember his ministry for three years was intensified. It wasn't one hour a day for our Lord. They had to leave everything when our Lord was here. And then they just stayed with the Lord and he taught them uh, sometimes three days straight. We saw where they didn't have any sleep and uh, they had no food for three days straight. And He was healing people and giving doctrine three days straight. And so it wasn't an hour here and an hour there. It was a constant thing uh, during our Lord's ministry. And even then, even after two years of constant doctrine, you see, when our, our Lord opened His mouth, He was going to teach doctrine. 
there were a few times that he would ever just uh, uh, have superficial conversation. Uh, all of his thoughts focused around doctrine. They had to. That's what's going to take him to the cross. And if he did not have his focus on doctrine, he wouldn't be able to make it through. Uh, but all of his focus was on doctrine. That's all he talked about all the time. And for two years, these disciples heard these doctrines. And now they're worried about bread as if our Lord could not produce bread. They saw it with their very own eyes, and they're really showing their lack of concentration over this two-year period. Uh, Probably Peter sometimes just fell asleep uh, when our Lord kept going and going during his sermons uh, for days. And so he insults them, people of a little faith, why are you reasoning among yourselves about having no bread? In other words, they've forgotten doctrine, Uh, They've forgotten the use of the faith rest drill. And they're standing there by the Sea of Galilee. And the first thing they should remember is the storm out there in the Sea of Galilee and all the waves and how the Lord uh, stood up and said two words, Be still, and it was still. And they saw all these things and they saw the miracles. But doctrine obviously has much more power than miracles. And if you do not have miracles... If you do not have doctrine in your stream of consciousness, then all the miracles that we could ever see would uh, be useless. They would have no meaning, just as they had no meaning to the disciples. Then in 16.9, our Lord's going to repeat Himself twice. Not that He's taken back, although He is a bit uh, in His humanity, uh, the same way we should be taken back a bit when we read this. He says it twice. Don't you understand yet? Then he says again, Don't you remember? So he's really ripping them apart. And the only thing the disciples have ever heard from the Lord is being ripped apart. Yet they saw a soldier, a Capernaum soldier, uh, they saw him uh, from Rome, a Gentile, receive great praise from our Lord. And they saw another Gentile woman get great praise from our Lord. But when it comes to them, and they're His very uh, close students with Him all the time, He just rips them apart and they deserve it because they don't understand and these other people did understand. But at least they stuck with the Lord which shows their humility. Don't you understand yet? Don't you remember? Now, there's a principle here that the rate of learning doctrine must always exceed the rate of forgetting. In our lives, if we don't uh, keep on something day by day, we're going to forget it. Uh, Why do uh, children go to school every day? Well, if they went every other day, or if they just went on the weekends, or if they just went on Sunday, they would forget everything. If you tried to learn algebra once a Sunday, by the time you got to the next Sunday, it's over. You've forgotten everything, everything you've learned that first Sunday. And everything I learned about algebra, I know that 2x equals 10, x equals 5. I know about that much. All the other stuff I learned, I've uh, pretty much forgotten. You were to throw down some long equation, and it would be as Greek to me now as it was when I was in school. But in school, I understood it. Why? Because it was daily. It was a daily thing that we learned And it's no different with the Word of God. It must be a daily thing. And the disciples were there daily. And yet, uh, they were so hard-headed. One of the reasons is, though, and uh, they have an excuse where we don't. We have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. These disciples did not receive that until the day of Pentecost. So they're, they're playing golf, as it were, with a big handicap. They're on the playing field with an enormous handicap. No wonder they're forgetting everything. They don't have their mentor and their teacher. And our Lord knows that, and that's why He's going to offer it to them. But then they're still so hard-headed, they really don't see the significance in it. But on the day of Pentecost, when Peter receives the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, he's going to start teaching doctrine for the first time. And he's going to start to sound like somebody who knows something. Well, it was the filling of God the Holy Spirit that did all of this. And uh, just think, and, and just try to apply it to yourselves, just think, if uh, Peter and all the disciples had been around the Lord day after day, and remember the Lord's a perfect Bible teacher. Perfect. There's a, and He makes things very perspicuous and, and very clear. 
Now, sometimes I might not make it clear because I'm just a mere human. But our Lord was the perfect Lord Jesus Christ. He made it very clear. And still, after two years of constant study, our Lord didn't let up. I mean, they would have some reprieves where He would go to sleep on a ship or when uh, uh, they might relax and have dinner together, but uh, they would mess up and have to act as waiters. Uh, There were certain times when they had reprieve, but most of the time, every waking hour, they were learning doctrine from the Lord. And not only learning it from His lips, but seeing Him in action, seeing the miracles, seeing His manner of life. And they learned nothing. So we can never get enough doctrine, or we can never expose ourselves enough to doctrine. And even though we have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, well, actually, that is our motivator to really get with it. That is our motivator that says, let us learn day by day. And so uh, they they went every day and still didn't get anywhere. So I'm not shocked. And I don't know about anyone here, just uh, from people on the outside that I've met all my life who have been exposed to doctrine. I'm not shocked that they don't know so much uh, when, uh, when I go into conversation with them. And uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember hearing that. And the reason is they've... Uh, well, they've been hodgepodge with it. And even if you're daily with it, as the disciples were, and you don't have the filling of God the Holy Spirit, you're not going to catch on to it. You know, it's as if uh, it's like the disciples are like the people who hear eternal security day after day, get the verses related to it, can actually stare at the verse with their own eyes, and then say, I don't see it. I don't understand. What about this verse? Or what about this? And they just can't grasp grasp the principle. And the disciples are the same way. They can't grasp grasp the principle. And we're going to see later that uh, they can't grasp the most simple of principles, and that is that our Lord has to go to the cross. And Peter's going to make a big deal out of that and say, oh no, Lord, you don't have to go to the cross. Yes, He does. And that's the means of our salvation. Good thing He didn't listen to Peter, but of course He wouldn't. But this shows that there, that is the most basic of doctrines. We know that Christ had to go to the cross. Peter didn't even understand that much. And he'd been with the Lord for two years, and the Lord had repeatedly. All these tenses are linear action sort, meaning that he kept on teaching them these things. And they still didn't get it. And it just boggles the mind. And like I said, uh, one of their excuses would be the lack of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And we too, without the filling of God the Holy Spirit, learn nothing of spiritual matters. We don't go anywhere. So in uh, he says, don't you understand yet? Don't you remember the rate of learning doctrine must exceed the rate of forgetting and you must use doctrine consistently and constantly or you will forget it. And the principle is, unless doctrine is number one in your life, you'll never be able to recall doctrine when you need it most. Right now, Peter and the disciples uh, need doctrine. And then when our Lord goes to the cross, they're going to need doctrine most. But they're not going to have it. And even though they were exposed to it all the time, they definitely didn't make it number one. Their priorities were all wrong. They obviously had their eyes on people. They had their eyes on self. They had their eyes on food. They had their eyes on logistical grace support, which they would receive. Uh, but they they still just uh, couldn't come around to the faith rest drill, no matter how much our Lord taught it. So it indicates that while they were exposed to it, uh, they were thinking about other things. And that means doctrine wasn't number one for them. They had the different priorities. They had things that that they had to do. I don't know what they were doing. They were standing there in the desert with our Lord. Uh, He kind of made it to where the only thing they could do is listen to doctrine. But somehow it still wasn't number one. If it had been number one, they would have understood it. Like the, uh, the, the Gentiles understood it. Like the Phoenician woman. Like the soldier. These people, our Lord prays personally. And even as an aside, it was an insult to them. They'd been with him the whole time. They should have known this stuff by now. And yet, all the way up until very shortly, the only thing the disciples have ever received from the Lord is an insult. And they deserved it. And they knew it. And that's why they stuck around him. 
But that's the only thing they've ever received up until Peter. And Peter's about to get a compliment, and we'll see what he does with that. And this is a whole other story. 16.10 Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. In other words, don't you understand? Don't you remember the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? And also, uh, don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? We remember that. They took up 12 uh, for the five loaves, one for each disciple. And they took up seven uh, for uh, the seven loaves, one for each loaf. Then in 1611, how could you not understand that I did not speak to you about bread? But beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then, in 1612, then they understood that he had not told them to keep on guard against the yeast in bread. They were looking at it as, oh, we must not eat bread with yeast in it. We're going to have to go to those little uh, crackers that have no flavor that we use on communion over there. And they thought we're going to have to eat these things all the time. No, it's not about uh, bread. It's about their false doctrine. He was making a, a a spiritual analogy. Now, our Lord covered a lot of doctrine in three years. He had a three year ministry starting at the age of 30, and it was compact into three years. And they didn't get any of it. And although he he covered a wide range of doctrine, uh, we note he covered dispensations. He covered faith alone in Christ alone. He covered the faith rest drill. He covered just about all the doctrines that could be covered. Occupation with Christ. The whole unique spiritual life. And he even foreshadowed the coming of the church age and what they would have. Yet, they, even though they heard it for three years and it was compact, they still didn't get it. But our Lord kept going. And our Lord knew they weren't getting it. But did our Lord slow down for them? Well, He helped them along, obviously. And when they had a question, when they came up to Him, as they did often, and said, what do you mean about the uh, yeast of the scribes and Pharisees? Well, He would describe it. But there were many questions they had that our Lord just never answered, and they never asked. Uh, It was way over their heads anyway, but He still taught it anyway. And why did He teach it? Because even though his very immediate disciples right around him didn't get it, there were Phoenicians in other lands getting it. There were there was the Roman soldier who was getting it. And he knew there were others uh, that weren't right there face to face with him who were getting it. And they were understanding it. And they were using the faith rest drill. And how they got it, we're, we're not real sure. Maybe word of mouth. Uh, Maybe they just stood around and didn't make themselves as obvious as the disciples. The disciples were the ones who Jesus called out for a reason. And one of the reasons is to show us grace that He can turn stupid people who are ignorant of doctrine into great people. And Peter, of all people, uh, starts out very, very uh, ignorant of doctrine. And it's not a point that we can make fun of him. But he grows up uh, later on, especially when he gets the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be greater than any of us ever will be. That is the Apostle Peter. And, of course, the, and what happens, there's a contrast here between the Apostle Peter later on will be introduced in Acts to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was a genius. There's nothing stupid about him. He picked up on things quickly, and it wasn't his human IQ, it was his spiritual IQ once he went blind and realized, hey, this is the only thing in life. And he believed in Christ, and then uh, when the Apostle Paul tackled something, he did it full blast. And uh, uh, when he was an unbeliever, he wanted to be a religious zealot, and he tackled that full blast. And he became one of the most noted of the uh, religious zealots ever. And he would even persecute Christians, and he knew the Old Testament by heart, word for word. And then when he became a believer, after he was blinded, it was the only way that uh, he would come to faith alone in Christ alone. And then he believed, and then he went full blast for the spiritual life. And he slipped up even. But then uh, Peter, on the other hand, started out ignorant. Well, he was just an average Joe. 
All of us are average Joes, by the way. We all uh, start out as believers. When we believe in Christ, uh, we're all in the same boat. We're all on the same team. We're all average. doesn't matter what your spiritual gift. But guess what? With the unique things that we have, the 39 irrevocable absolutes, the two power options, three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, ten problem-solving devices, with those things, we can be extraordinary. And all of us really are extraordinary. And so he covered a lot of doctrine in three years. And this is the point. Uh, But uh, just because they didn't understand it all, he didn't stop and baby them and bring them along. He didn't have time for that. He was on a mission. And the fact is, if uh, some of these things that I teach might be over the heads of uh, some of the people I'm teaching to. And when I first started, everything that I learned was, uh, I would uh, pick up a bit, uh, a piece here and a piece there, but a lot of it was way over my head. I would hear protocol, plan of God, prototype, spiritual life, and I would hear all of these vocabulary words. And I didn't know what they were, but I would pick up on some things and say, yeah, man, that's better than anything I'll get anywhere else. And so I picked up on it, and eventually you come around to it. It takes time, and it's taking the disciples' time. But uh, Jesus uh, doesn't uh, slow down for them because He knows when they receive the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, they're going to recall a lot of these things. And by the way, Matthew didn't write this right away. He wasn't chronicling this as it was happening. He remembered all of these things and wrote it years later, years after the death of Christ. And so even the books in the Bible that we receive, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of which were written after the death of Christ, all of these things were brought back to their memory by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, even though they weren't getting it, he knew they would get it later. And now we have in 1613, we move on to 1613, and then on uh, on from there, and we have a totally uh, different, uh, we have a change of subject. And uh, notice the disciples just got chewed out a little bit, not too harshly. But now Peter's going to finally say something good for once. Now we noted Peter's been breaking through every every now and then. But we know Peter does because Peter's a loud mouth. He wears everything on his sleeve. You want to know who Peter is? He'll tell you who he is. He, he's just like a, he's an outgoing person, and he doesn't hide anything. And uh, if he's messed up, he'll he'll come up. I messed up the other day. I did this. Or if he's been uh, right, he'll say I was right. The Lord uh, uh, told me I was right on this, and then get a big head about it. Uh, but uh, he would always be just right out there in the open. Everybody knew who Peter was, and that's why when our Lord was uh, being crucified. Uh, they all recognized Peter and said, hey, that man was with Jesus all the time. That's because he had a big mouth. And everybody recognized who Peter was because he would always talk and insert himself into the situation. So when Jesus came to the area, that is the area ruled by the Tetrarch, Herod Philip, in the city, and this would be Caesarea uh, and Philippi, Caesarea hyphen Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say? The Son of Man is. He starts out impersonally with uh, the disciples. And he doesn't say, who do you say at first? He starts out impersonally and he says, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, who do people say I am? That's what our Lord is saying. Then in 1614, they answered. That is, they all chimed in with their different answers. Some say John the Baptist, the herald. John the Baptist is, of course, the herald of Jesus Christ. Some say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, the ones that said Jeremiah were the ones who uh, had a little bit of uh, discernment because uh, Jeremiah was the one who heralded the fifth cycle of discipline. And uh, even some of these religious people were looking out over the land and saying, it looks like we're close to the fifth cycle. And so they said, maybe he's Jeremiah coming to proclaim our destruction. Uh, But they all had uh, some type of... uh, Maybe he's one of the prophets. Maybe he's this. Maybe he's that. None of them said he was the Son of God, though. And then he said to them, and this is linear action, sorry, meaning that he had to say it more than once. He said it over and over again. And he had to say it uh, more than once because he took them off guard. 
because he was just impersonal with them and said, who do, who do they say that I am? Now he gets personal with them and he looks at them and he says, who do you say that I am? And they didn't answer. They were kind of shocked and taken aback and they didn't know what to say. I mean, here's the Lord Jesus Christ in all His perfection looking at you and saying, who do you say that I am? And so they, they don't answer him. Then he says it again. Who do you say that I am? Linear action, sorry. It doesn't say how many times he asked it. Maybe two, maybe three. It just means he had to say it more than once. And he said it several times. So he got personal with them. And all doctrine, by the way, gets personal. And uh, that's what my pastor always taught me. And if it doesn't step on your toes today, it'll step on your toes tomorrow. It steps on my toes all the time. I can see some of these. I can see. I can see myself and Peter in some of these occasions when something would go wrong and I just fall all apart. Well, you're just being like Peter, and you know I kick myself in the butt, but you don't see that. It's none of your business, and you're none of my business in terms of personally. But it's going to kick you in the butt, and it's going to feel personal, even though and to me it's just me teaching the word. It's going to feel personal. And if it gets personal, take it personally as before the Lord, not before me. Because doctrine shakes all of us up, and doctrine encourages all of us. And that's why Hebrews 4.15 says this, Everything is naked and open. With Him we have to do. And that means God knows everything about us. And so, even though we don't... Uh, we might not want things to be so personal with God. And we might not want God to see us on our bad days, but He does. Everything's naked and open with Him. He can see us as we are. And when the Word of God strikes us, well, we, we kind of see ourselves as God sees us, and it might not feel too good. And it didn't feel good with uh, uh, these disciples either. But finally, uh, somebody's going to say something great. Finally, one of these disciples is going to say something right for once in their lives. So he says, And who do you say that I am? Then in 16, 16, Simon Peter answered. And he answered in this manner. This is actually how it comes out in the Greek with its... Uh, the way the Greek... The, the reason why the, um, the uh, New Testament was written in Greek, of course... Matthew and Aramaic, but translated into Greek, is because the Greek has such a nuance in language. Not modern Greek. Modern Greek's just like another language today. But Koine Greek and all the other eight forms that were actually twelve forms that were used in the New Testament have such detail to them that uh, one word can make up one English paragraph. And that's how uh, intense, really, the Greek language was. And we noted yesterday how... There were two meanings to leave. And what they did in English is the, the, the translators didn't know what to do, so they said, and the Lord left, and He departed. That's because the Greek said it twice. Well, he, did, he actually did two different things. Left mentally and departed physically. And that's what Greek brings out. That's how nuanced it is. One word can mean that many things. And so, uh, this is why all of... This is definitely why Greek is a part of the inerrant Word of God because of its, it's so detailed and, it, and uh, it needs to be clear to us as to what it means. So Simon Peter answered, You keep on being the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now Peter, for once, had the right answer. For once, he said something correct. And in saying something correct, he seems to forget about all the other times that he failed, which is fine. We should disregard those things that are behind and press onward toward the upward call of Christ, upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But in this case, what Peter does is he uh, he gets a fat head in a minute. Not right now, but he's about to. And what our Lord does now, you see, our Lord compliments him. Now, he had been ripping the disciples apart for ever since they'd been with him. And now Peter, for one time, gets a compliment. And he deserved it. Because our Lord gave it to him, of course, he deserved a little compliment. But uh, Peter took this victory. Peter took this as knowing this most basic of doctrines. Guess what? An unbeliever 
who believes in Christ, two seconds later can say, He is the Christ, the Son of God. So he was stating a point of, uh, actually, salvation. Uh, that is how Peter was saved. He believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he states his faith for the first time. For the first time, he probably now understands what he believed in. You see, sometimes when we believe in Christ, it starts out with a, a very little bit of faith. And a lot of people aren't really sure what they're doing, but the pastor says, uh, bow your heads, close your eyes, and then the pastor says, uh, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right now you'll be saved if you believe that He died on the cross as a substitute for you. And you might hear those words, and you might want salvation, and you uh, say that, and you believe it a little bit. But you really aren't uh, too up on it. You're still saved. It only takes a little bit of faith, see. And so now Peter has just enough to proclaim the gospel one time. And he says, you keep on being the Christ, the Son of the living God. Big deal. Of course he is. He has been since you've known him. And you believe that even though you didn't even uh, understand it fully. You believe that. But finally he's getting enough to say it. And there's a principle in that. When someone first gets saved, they have no business trying to give the gospel. They're not going to get it straight. They're not going to get it right. And the problem with Christianity today, one of the reasons why the gospel message has been so obscured is because brand new believers, and this is encouraged by the pastors and everything who don't teach doctrine, and they say, go out and witness. They don't even have enough information to go out and witness. And so when they go out and somebody asks them a question, they'll start stuttering and start to, even though they believe in Christ, they might say, well, uh, well invite Christ into your heart. And a lot of these false doctrines got started by ignorant believers who just didn't know any better. And uh, they were sincere, I'll give them that, but they're still wrong. And they've really confused a lot of people. And all of that has to do with a satanic influence. And we'll see in a moment, uh, right now our Lord's praising Peter. And not uh, too much longer from now, our Lord's going to be calling Peter Satan. Uh, imagine the Lord standing before you, looking you in your eyeballs and saying, Get away from me, Satan. That's exactly what he's going to say to Peter. And there's no other recorded point at which our Lord called call anyone Satan except Satan himself, except for Peter. So that was a harsh insult. I mean, uh, it would probably be enough to make Peter want to cry. I don't think he did. Uh, he he might have been a little upset by it, but uh, he got fat-headed over what's happening now. And this was not our Lord's intent. So Jesus complimented him. And then he gets so arrogant over this one compliment that he gets out of line. And what our Lord is uh, finally complimenting, complimenting him on is the fact that he's gotten a little doctrine. But we have to m remember that just a little doctrine can be dangerous. You've got to start putting it all together. And uh, a little doctrine can be dangerous because when you get a little bit, uh, you might want it. Well, you get excited about it. Uh, and Peter would have a tendency to do this. Learn something, get excited about it, and just go out and tell the world, but you don't have it all together. And then when the attacks come, you just don't know how to handle it and you fall all apart. And uh, this is what happens. So a little doctrine can be dangerous. And... Uh, and it's and to have doctrine, you see, uh, Peter is taking this little bit of doctrine that he's finally gotten, and he's using it as a status symbol and a source of pride. Right now, he just becomes the leader of the pack, the pack of twelve, and he and uh, our Lord uh, just complimented Peter. He never complimented any of the other disciples. So he can now, as he had a tendency to do, look around at the other disciples and say to himself, I'm better than they are. And that's exactly what he did. In fact, we're going to see something so astounding in a moment that it's going to blow your mind what Peter does. And we'll see why our Lord gets so harsh with him because Peter goes way out of line. He, he actually, well, we'll see. And then in uh, 18, or 16, 17, this is the compliment. And Jesus answered him, You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. Uh, yours might take the uh, transliteration and say Bar-Jonah. It just means uh, Simon, son of Jonah. That was his name. And actually right here it switches to Aramaic, but this is what the words mean. You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven... 
And that means that the Father in heaven is the source of all divine viewpoint. And remember that it's God the Father who has imparted to God the Holy Spirit in common grace to give to us the gospel of Christ. So again, and Jesus answered him, You are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Now what's Peter been interested in this whole time? Flesh and blood, bread, food, something to feed the body. And then finally he said something that's spiritual for the first time. He, finally he said something, divine viewpoint. All the time before it's all human viewpoint. Oh, he's worried because we didn't bring bread and we should not eat the bread of the Pharisees, that literal bread of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so finally he gets a question and he gets it right. He probably just had a wild guess and got it pretty, uh, pretty close and then he feels all proud of himself now. And so he goes toward pride. So you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And of course we have Scripture that verifies that the Gospel is not revealed by human viewpoint, but by divine viewpoint. And that's what it means by my Father in heaven has revealed it. It's just talking about that God the Father is the source of divine viewpoint. Now, of course, we studied common and efficacious grace as being given by God the Holy Spirit. That is still the case, but all of that comes... All of the things that God the Holy Spirit gives us is the thoughts of God the Father, so that means it is the source of divine viewpoint. Then in 16.18, And I tell you that you are Peter, which is Petros. And I tell you that you are Peter. You know, he started out saying... Now, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. That was his name. And now our Lord says, and I tell you, you are Peter, Petras. Petras, P-E-T-R-A-S. What's that mean? He's a chip off the old block. Why? Because he's in union with Christ. And guess what? This is the first uh, foreshadowing of the prototype being turned into the protocol, actually. What this is saying, you see, our Lord right now is living the prototype. And He looks at Peter, and He can actually, as our Lord Jesus Christ, as a prophet as well, could look forward and say, uh, Peter's going to be a chip off the old block. He's going to live the protocol spiritual life. Our Lord lived the prototype. Peter's going to live the protocol. So He says to uh, him, You are Peter, a chip off the old block, and on this mountain... Mountain, it refers to this rock, refers to Jesus Christ. I will build my church. This is all a foreshadowing of the church. Nothing of the church had ever been heard of. What did they have in Israel at this time? Synagogues. And nobody ever heard of a church. And so actually, our Lord compliments Peter, and then He gives him some doctrine. And He actually foreshadows for Peter, some things that are going to occur. And that is that the prototype spiritual life. What he's actually telling to Peter, even though Peter doesn't even get uh, one ounce of what he's saying, what he's saying to Peter is, the prototype that I'm living is coming to you in the protocol. Which means you'll be a chip off the old block. I'll be the rock, you'll be a chip off of me. And that's all he's saying. And when we live the uh, protocol spiritual life, we're a chip off the old block. We're acting just like we're imitating Christ, actually. Now, it also has to do... Now, that is if you take the tact of uh, experiential sanctification. And we can be a chip off the old block in experiential sanctification if we fulfill our unique spiritual life. Now, all of us, as, once we believe in Christ, all of us are a chip off the old block. Why? Because we're in union with Christ. We're heirs of Christ. We receive 39 irrevocable things. Whether we're winner or loser, we receive 39 irrevocable things. But this has to do... You could break this down into two categories. Positional sanctification, meaning you're a chip off the old block when you believe in Christ. That's all given to you by grace. And... You can be a chip off the old block experientially by living the unique spiritual life, fulfilling the protocol plan of God for your life. And that means you are experientially a chip off the old block. And so here he says to Peter, 
uh, he actually gives him a name. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this mountain, the rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And uh, that is, of course, true. And that has to deal with uh, eternal security. Once you believe in Christ, once you're in position with Christ, the gates of Hades, uh, the gates of hell, will not overpower it. We're kept by the power of God, remember. And if you don't believe in eternal security, and uh, I know you, the people here today do, but uh, there's uh, some new people who listen on the Internet all the time, and they probably wonder about this eternal security. And I know they do. And they say, well, uh, that means I can just do whatever I want. And that means that uh, if I do whatever I want, I'm still saved. Yes, that's what it means. Uh, but uh, there will be punishment since you're a child of God. But that's grace. And if you don't understand that, you'll never get ahead in the spiritual life. You'll just spin your tires and you'll end up a legalist and uh, go the wrong way. And then in 1619, I will give you the kingdom of the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's probably what it says in your translation. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But this is actually plural. And he's still talking to Peter, but he is uh, now he's talking to all of them, including Peter. And this goes uh, with the exception of Judas Iscariot. He just says y'all, just like we would say y'all down south. Uh, would you all like to go out to eat? And let's say there's uh, 20 people standing around and you're looking at a few and you say, would you all like to go out to eat? And it doesn't mean you're including the whole 20. It's, you're just asking a few people who should presume to know that they're the ones being asked. And, and so Judas wasn't part of this, even though he says, I will give you all the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What's this mean? What does this mean? Does this mean uh, Peter's going to have the keys? And this is what many people bring it down to because they say when you go to heaven, who are you going to go to? St. Peter, that's what they think. And then St. Peter's going to say, all right, go through the gate. You've been good enough. Good little boy. Bye-bye. Go into heaven. And that's the way they interpret it. But this isn't what it means. It just means they have the prerogative of witnessing. And guess what? When you witness, what are you holding in your hands? The keys to the gates of heaven. You too have it. Not only did Peter have it, not only did the eleven disciples have it, and soon to be twelve with the Apostle Paul, you have it. Every church age believer has been given the prerogative of witnessing if they know enough to do it. And if you know enough to witness, you have the keys. And when you witness, you, as it were, are giving the keys of heaven into the hands of someone who doesn't have them. And you say, believe in Christ? And it's just as if you say, I offer you keys. And then they say, I believe in Christ? They take the keys. Now they have the keys to get into heaven, and then they can offer it to someone else once they learn enough. That's all it means. And it doesn't mean that Judas is standing up at the, at the gates of heaven today letting everybody through. No, if you've believed in Christ, you're going through and uh, Peter has nothing to do with it. If Peter were standing there, you'd blast right through him and go straight to be face to face with the Lord. And that's how it's described. When we die, we go to be face to face with the Lord. There's no interim. We don't go to a place of purgatory and we definitely don't go and look at Peter. Why would we? He's just another man like we are. Who do we look at? Our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we have our eyes on. And the Catholic Church gets hold of this and they think Peter is something great. And in fact, they think they're, uh, the Pope now is descended, a descendant of Peter uh, in the apostolic line. But there are no apostles anymore. But they think that the Pope is like the Apostle Peter. They're just a, another form of an apostle. Apostleship is over now and uh, they're so ridiculous it doesn't even warrant mentioning so what we have here is uh, the fact that uh, what happens here is it, it's equivalent and it's relevant as per John 20:22. 20, you can flip there if you wish to, and because this is uh, this is a parallel passage, a parallel passage to uh, actually it's parallel in that it explains 16:19, and that's John 20:22. 20, and when he had said this. And when he had said this, 
he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit was not given. The filling of God, the Holy Spirit, remember, was not given until the day of Pentecost. So what is this referring to when our Lord breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Spirit? Well, they're still technically under the age of Israel. Technically. I mean, it is the hypostatic union, but they're still synagogues and there's and uh, our Lord's fulfilling the law. He's not abolishing it. He's a fulfilling it, as He said. And uh, so what we have here is endowment. And there's a difference between endowment and filling. David had the endowment of God the Holy Spirit. Even Saul, for a while, had the endowment of God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would function in all different kinds of ways. Remember Samson and Delilah. Samson had the Holy Spirit so that he would have abnormal human strength. And that was it. No real spiritual significance, but it did have a significance in God's plan. And also, uh, David had the endowment so that he could be a good ruler. And he was a good ruler because of the endowment. And others were endued with the Spirit so that they could build the temple exactly the way God wanted it built. And uh, they would be geniuses in engineering, but it wasn't that they were, or in construction or however you want to describe it, but it wasn't that they were so smart in building things, not then. It was the Holy Spirit that gave them the knowledge to build it. And they would know exactly how to build that uh, temple. And it would be a beautiful sight to see that temple uh, built really by God the Holy Spirit who endued these people. And it wasn't their own human talent doing it. It's a supernatural type of talent given to them by the endowment. And this is what's given to the disciples. And because they'll get endowment and then later they'll get the filling. The filling of God the Holy Spirit is what is even better and far greater than endowment. But they're given the endowment. And uh, this is where it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and you declare the gospel, and actually, and then it says, they are remitted. It's talking about remission of sins. It's not that they're going up to people and saying, your sins are remitted. Uh, this has to do with technical Greek, and what it's saying is that they go up to someone and say, believe in Christ, and they say, I believed in Christ, and then the disciples would say, your sins have been forgiven. Not because they remitted them, because uh, it was all done on the cross. And since they have now believed, and a lot of them will do it, will say they believed in their minds, and then as a result they'll say, I believed in Christ, and then uh, the disciples could go around and say, Your sins have been remitted. And whoever, and that means they have responded to the gospel, and whoever sins doesn't deal with uh, all the sins, it deals with the rejection of Christ. Remember, there was one sin that did not go to the cross, and that was rejection of Christ. And so, whoever sins rejects Christ, you retain, and that means they retain the sin nature, and they retain everything uh, regarding their eternal damnation. So you can say to them that their sins are remitted if they believe. But if they reject, you also have the right to say to them that they are condemned. And that means they have the keys. And you can witness to somebody, and as I've witnessed to many people, and I've never told them this if they've rejected it, but I had the right. And if they say, I don't believe that, I could say, well, you're going to hell. I've never done it because I just made it clear enough and uh, they'll find out soon enough. And it's a sad thing and I really don't want to uh, make it that clear to them, especially if they're relatives or whatever. So I just say, well, it's your choice not to believe. But you have the keys to say, well, if you do not believe, you're going to hell that you have the keys to say that. And if they do believe, you have the keys to say you are going to heaven. You're heaven bound. And you have the right to do that. And that is what the Lord has given not only to Peter, but to y'all. And that y'all includes every believer in the church age as well. And we do have a duty to witness when we know how. If we don't know how, then wait and learn the doctrine. You'll eventually learn how. It took me many years of learning doctrine before I was comfortable enough to give the gospel and get it right. Then in 1620, uh, then, or is that right? Uh, it went from 1619, and then I described the parallel. What is it? 
Okay. I will give you all the key, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That's the prerogative of witnessing. And you declare the gospel and they'll be remitted. And whoever sins, that is, they reject Christ, uh, you retain. Now, you can say, now, I guess I just uh, skip that. I'll go, I'll go back to it tomorrow. I guess I just didn't get the last half right there, and I don't know why, but I'll go back to it tomorrow, and we'll move on to 1620, and I'll probably go over 1619 and 20 again, and then we'll move on, because I'm about to close anyway. And then in 1620, then he commanded his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. Now, why did he do this? First of all, he told them, hey, you've got the keys. you got the keys and you have the permission to go out and give the gospel. And then you have the permission to say, yes, you're saved or you're going to hell because you rejected it. And they were given that permission, but it was for a future date. And then he commands them, he tells them, you have that right, but don't do it right now. Then he commanded his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. That's because our Lord, uh, through doctrine, had to present Himself to Israel first. And that's stated many times in Romans, that Christ must present Himself first to Israel. And He has to do that before He releases the keys for the church age. And that's the principle. He still is holding out hope for Israel. And He's going to give them, uh, from His matchless grace, a little more time to wake up to Him, even though everywhere He's gone, most of them rejected Him. Uh, But grace comes before judgment, and He knows a severe judgment is coming upon Israel. So He's making sure through His grace that they all receive the message first. So He gives it to Israel first, and then He said, and then after that, they're free to give it to anyone they choose. And that means that the keys are given to the church age now. And that's when the church age begins. That's when they're given the license to present these things. On the day of Pentecost is the official start of the pre-canon church age. And that is the point where they can go out and proclaim the gospel to everyone, Gentile and Jew alike. And Peter will do it. Peter will be the first to stand up on the day of Pentecost. And he will talk about uh, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, his spiritual death. And he'll also talk about the uh, fact that our Lord will be resurrected. And we'll, we will see tomorrow night how Peter gets upset at this. But uh, at the, in the end, he grows in grace enough to where he finally puts these things together, as all of us must grow in grace and in knowledge. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things. And may we grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that we can come to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.